Okay, we are recording. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, in the broker forum the other day, Kelly asked me if we do a class on the standard contract. And the standard contract is one of my favorites. So I was happy to, uh, to do it. It will we'll take an hour, um, maybe less, maybe a few minutes more. And, and we're gonna go through the uh, paragraphs nine and 12 of the standard contract. Feel free at any time to um, ask questions, raise a hand. Chances are though, I'm about to answer your question as soon as uh, you raise your hand. So don't worry about it. I don't want you to sit there thinking, oh my God, I don't understand this bit. Just raise your hand and we'll get it. So the standard contract is very, very similar to the as is contract in every, every aspect, except for two paragraphs. And those two paragraphs are paragraph nine and paragraph 12. Paragraph nine is the costs to the seller. And paragraph 12 is the inspection period. So those are the two main, two main differences. There's a few little differences that if you were really interested, I can talk about. Uh, for instance, there are, and we'll, we will talk about the mold addenda, mold rider. But the mold rider doesn't appear on the as-is contract on paragraph 19, but it does in the standard contract. And I'll explain why as we go through it. So the standard contract was really the main type of contract that we used back in the day. So until the market crashed in 2007, there really wasn't anybody using an as-is contract. The as-is contract became popular in those years when we had lots of foreclosures, lots of short sales, and banks weren't going to do any repairs. So it was pointless to have the standard, uh, have the as is contract. The, so you'll know um, most probably if you, by the mistakes that some older, or, or let's just say more uh, realtors that have been in the business longer, they make the mistake on the as is of saying that if they've made a request for repairs, that stops the clock. Well, we know with the as-is contract, if you make a request for repairs, then you have to get those repairs negotiated within the loan approval period and the addendum describing the repairs signed and executed during that loan approval, during the inspection period, I apologize. Whereas with the standard contract, we'll learn that it stops the clock as soon as you make the request for repairs. And you'll notice that there'll be a couple of realtors out there who've been in the business a long while or get confused and think just because they've asked that everything's okay. But with the as is contract, that clock keeps running. Standard contract, the inspection clock stops. Now, I was asked, why do I recommend that people use the standard contract? Well, it's all, ultimately, it's going to be down to the, to the seller what the contract they want to accept. So for listing agents, this is a conversation that you would have with your seller. It tends to be more of a sticky contract. It holds the buyer's feet to the fire. It stops the tire kickers. It stops people just coming along and, and in effect, using the as-is contract as a second showing. So they'll make an offer on a property and then go see it within the inspection period and if they don't like it they cancel it's a favorite with out of town buyers now different markets call for different contracts in this market that we've just been through and we're still going through in, 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 from what i can see is that it's a good time to, for a seller to use a standard contract especially in like multiple offer situations that the person that's going to win it is going to be committed to moving forward with that transaction and not go through all the agony of going through several buyers that cancel for little or no reason using the as-is contract. So the customer's often unaware of which contract or, or the fact that we actually have two contracts. I guarantee you that the majority of realtors out there have never had the discussion with their seller or with their buyer explaining that there are different types of contract. We, we, we tend to, and when I say we, I say you, tend to just slide the uh, as-is contract in front of them and say sign here uh, without explaining the benefits of, of the standard versus the benefits of the as-is. And I think 
that's just mainly because that's the way most realtors were taught when they when they came into the business because we're we're a, we're a business that where the where the uh, experienced agents teach the younger agents and they um they they generally will just teach them the way they do it and the general and the majority of contracts are written on as is there are some real estate teams out there that I know of that insist on a standard contract for every transaction. And this is why we need to keep learning this contract because it, at some stage, you're gonna be asked to write a standard contract if you haven't already. So in my handout, I talk about the perfect listing agent. It's not really the perfect listing agent, but it's the, uh, the agent that really knows what they're doing is gonna explain the benefits of both of those contracts. So, on a, and I've given you some scripts in uh, page one of the handout, which is entitled the standard contract handout, um, which was revised in uh, 1021, or the contract was revised in 1021. And I'm not quite sure what I called it in Dropbox, but um, you'll find it. So in Dropbox, the link links you to um, just various little handouts that will help you. Um, so when, when you finish with this class, you can go back and look at these handouts and a lot of it will make more sense to you than, than you've it here. And so a property that's in a bad condition, it's most probably unlikely to, um, to be uh, a candidate for, um, let me just ask this person to mute because all I can hear is scratching. There you go. Um, it's a, uh, you know, a property in real bad conditions unlikely to be a candidate for a, a standard contract. That would definitely be one where we always are going to use an as-is contract. Whoever Jay is, can you mute man? Jessica. Oops. You're not on camera, so you've got to make a huge contribution to my fund. I'm, I'm teaching Jay and Yolanda. Right, paragraph nine. Let's talk about paragraph nine because that's the first time that you're gonna see a difference between the standard contract and the as-is contract. In paragraph nine of the contract, and I did put one in, in Dropbox for you. In this paragraph, the buyer decides how much they want to ask the seller to pay for in the three categories. And the three categories are general repairs, WDO treatment and repairs and costs associated with closing out open or expired permits or obtaining required building permits for unpermitted improvements to the property. So there's three spaces in paragraph nine where the buyer would say, okay, I, I, I inspected this property. I saw that there was a sticker on the electric panel which said, that they had a re regular termite treatment. I saw termite guards. I'm not really worried about termites, um, but I did see that there were some torn screens. There was a crack on the sidewalk. There was some paint peeling on the outside of the property. So therefore I would think I'm going to ask them to do a thousand dollars in repairs. Um, it would be if it was a person that was fairly handy, they may use it as a tactic not to ask too much for repairs and just say, I can fix all this stuff myself afterwards. So I'm not gonna ask the seller to repair anything. So therefore I'm gonna put zero in there. And obviously the, when you make your offer, you have no idea what's lurking in that property. It's, it, it, you're kind of guessing at it. So you, when you're walking through it, the buyer's gonna be looking and say, saying, well, I can't see anything wrong with it, but we don't know what's gonna be wrong with it. So it's kind of a guess and you can do it tactically depending on the market. It may be that in this market that it's um, tactical to just try and recoup some buyer costs by asking for some repair money. But as we'll find out later on, the buyer's not always going to get the repair uh, money because I threw a couple of things into my list of things that were wrong just then that most probably are not going to be covered by this, by this contract. Peeling paint would be one of them. So can the buyer put zero in these fields? Absolutely. So the result is a little hard for the parties to comprehend. But basically, if you put zero in the general repairs, WDO and permit, what's going to happen is that 
when the repair request comes from the buyer to the seller, the seller can choose to do the repairs or they can say, no, I'm not going to do the repairs, which gives the buyer an out. And I'm going to give you an example. So um, a few years back, we had a property in St. Petersburg that was on a standard contract. And the, after the inspection, they found that the property needed to be underpinned. There was $75,000 worth of work that needed to be done to this home. If I remember rightly, it was about a $400,000 home. So the buyer, scared to death, they had zero in their re repair limit. If the seller came back and said, no, I'm not going to repair it, the buyer can walk away. But in this case, the seller said, well, I have to repair it anyway, so I'm going to. And the buyer said, well, I don't want a house that's going to have to have $75,000 worth of work on, which made no sense whatsoever to me. But they finally understood that they were bound by this contract. The seller was prepared to do the repairs and ultimately it's a lot better, they're in a lot better position than they would have been had they missed that uh, massive repair that needed to be done to the property. Maybe on an as is contract, they might have chosen not to do a property inspection. So, with this contract, they did their inspection and they found out there was massive repairs. They had a zero limit, but because the seller was willing to do the repairs, they were bound to the contract and move forward. Any questions so far? Good stuff. I like it. I like it. Um, then, um, if at the time of uh, writing the offer, the buyer is of often kind of scared or uh, anxious as to what they're going to put in those amounts, um, if they're left blank, the, the amount defaults to 1.5% of the purchase price. And some listing agents I found are. Um, I had a horrible situation where we had a $800,000 property that the seller uh, was presented with a standard contract. And unfortunately, the buyer's agent missed the fact, and hard to believe, but the buyer's agent missed the fact that it was a standard contract. And it was left blank in paragraph nine, so it defaulted to 1.5%. So those of you that are good at working out 3% should be able to work out what 1.5% of 800 is. And if I think rightly, it's going to be eight threes of 24. So it'd be 24,000, half that $12,000 in repairs, the seller would be liable for because the blanks weren't filled. And so they ambled into the uh, contract thinking they were working with an as is, but after the inspection, the buyer's agent pointed out that all the repairs that they requested had to be done because they were under the $12,500 limit. And I hope I got my math right. I know it's a lot of money. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know how they missed it, but they, and people make mistakes, um, but that, that's a biggie. Um, and then uh, we're moving right along. So that's, that's the kind of overview of it. That gives you the, where we see how much is gonna to have to be spent is in paragraph nine. And then we move to paragraph 12, which gives the buyer the responsibility. In, in the as is contract, you don't have to do an inspection. And some of you will know that when I first started working for you in your offices, I removed a handout uh, that you had. It was a form that some offices were using that was called a contingency release addendum because it didn't make any sense. On the as is contract, there's no such thing as a inspection contingency. A contingency means that you have to do something. With an as is contract, you don't have to inspect. It's a right to inspect and a right to cancel. Or uh, an inspection period and or a right to cancel. So the buyer can, in an as-is contract, they can cancel for any or no reason. 
So having a release of a contingency when there isn't a contingency was a misstatement of law. Now, the where that form came from originally was with the standard contract. And there is actually a form in Florida Realtors uh, documents, which is a pre-printed form specifically to be used with a request for repairs under the standard contract. And it lists the three sections of general repairs, WDO, repair and treatment, and the permits expired, open and unpermitted improvements. So that form exists in, in um, I, I rarely ever see anyone use it, but it does exist in Florida Realtors documents. So paragraph 12. In 12A, the buyer decides how many days they need to conduct their inspections. It defaults to 15, same as the as is. But unlike the as is, the repairs do not have to be agreed upon during the inspection period. Talked about that earlier. The written request to repair has to be made during the inspection period. And the agreement as to what is going to be fixed and what's not can be completed after the inspection period ends. So I've given you a process flow, but you have to remember that with the and it's it's once you start working with the standard, it's hard to switch backwards and forwards, but you have to remember that with the as is, all everything has to be requested and an addendum be executed within the inspection period. On the standard, no. In 12A, it also requires a written notice to be sent to the seller per 12B C D during the inspection period. So the, the process is we inspect as the buyer within the period, and then we serve a notice on the seller requesting the repairs. And then the seller can either go ahead and make the repairs or go out and get estimates for how much that the repairs requested are going to be. And the seller has 10 days from the notice to go out and get those estimates or to begin the repairs and notify the buyer that they're gonna go ahead and repair everything that they've requested. So, um, that's that's a simplistic view of it and i'll repeat it the buyer does their inspection with a licensed inspector or a person who's licensed in the trade of which they're examining so they're allowed to use a licensed ac man to or lady to to investigate the ac they can have a licensed roofer take a look at the roof or they can have a general contractor look at any everything or a licensed inspector to look at everything so whereas with the as is, great aunt Mabel can come and do the inspection. You don't have to have a, a real inspector to do the inspection. Your uncle can do it, your nephew, the guy next door can do it. But with the standard, it has to be a licensed inspector. And once they've had the inspection done, they draw up their request and they serve notice on the seller. These are the things we want done. And then the seller has the opportunity either to repair it or go out and get estimates to find out how much it's all gonna cost. So paragraph 12B um, is where that, it, that uh, B1 says it's got to be licensed, inform seller of defects in writing, and then the seller can request the portion of the report that deals with the repairs. So if there is a request for repairs, the seller's entitled to see the report from the inspector that deals with those repairs that they've requested. In 12B2, it says, the following item, so we're gonna get into now what things, this is where most agents think that it gets a little complicated and it's not really. And, I, I, and in the handout, what I've done is I've just broken it down. I've taken it out of the paragraph form and put it into a list for you so that you can see clearly what it is we're asking for. And it, and it breaks it down very simply. In B 12B2, it says that the following items will be free of leaks, water or structural damage so that that's leaks water structural damage is the first section ceiling roof soffits and fascia exterior and interior walls doors windows and foundation so those items have to be free of leaks water or structural damage simple pimple and then the next time next wording they use is things have got to be in their working condition. 
these are great words to use if you're actually using the as is contract and you're writing an addendum requesting repairs. You can just literally snatch out the words from the standard contract and put them in your addendum for the as is contract when you're asking for repair. So working condition means it's operating in a manner in which the item was designed to operate and maintained until closing. So for example, if the pool pump is making a horrible grinding noise, is that operating in the manner in which the item was designed to operate and maintained and, and operates? The answer is no. Pool pumps are not supposed to be grinding. So that would be an item. It's an item that would be uh, under fall under pool equipment, and therefore that would fall within the standard contract items to be repaired. So in working condition, ceiling, roof, exterior walls, doors, windows, and foundation, you'll realize that's exactly the same as what's mentioned in 2B2. And then it goes on to say um, mechanical and electrical, security systems, sprinkler, pool equipment, pool, non-leased major appliances, heating and cooling systems, septic, plumbing, and machinery. All those things, uh, including seawalls and dockage, watercraft, watercraft lifts and related equipment. And that was an addition in the 2001, uh, 2021 contract. They added the watercraft lifts and related equipment for jet ski lifts, basically. We're not allowed to say jet ski. Apparently that's a protected uh, patent word. So it's a watercraft. We all know what it means, but it's a jet ski. So nice and clean, nice and crisp. You, you know that if the electrical's not working in the kitchen, it's going to fall within there. What you're always going to be wary of is what they call cosmetic items. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about cosmetic items in a second. But paragraph 12a also requires written notice to be sent to the seller uh, during the inspection period, as we explained. And so if, if any of these items are broken or not working in the manner in which they're supposed to, that goes on the, the written notice to the seller during the inspection period. Seller is also required to repair or replace torn screens, including pool and patio, fogged windows, missing roof tiles and shingles. Now we get to the cosmetic conditions. So in your head, I want you to imagine a house and we've just gone through all the things that the standard contract requires the seller to repair. It's the heavy lift things. It's the electrical, it's the plumbing, it's the septic, it's the pool, it's the pool pump, it's all the equipment. It's not things that are peeling paint, torn uh, carpets, curly roof tiles. All the things that are purely cosmetic are not included. So um, you'll notice it doesn't say anything about dead plants or dead lawn or trees or anything like that. It's all to do with what's going on between the drywall and on the exterior of the property, on the brickwork and the stucco. So aesthetic, it's easy for me to say, aesthetic imperfections that do not affect the working condition of the item unless the imperfection was caused by a defect the seller is obligated to replace. So if you have, and the one that always seems to cause arguments is rusty uh, hot water heater. So around the base of a hot water heater in the garage, you sometimes see that it's got rust on it. Um, the question always comes up and the answer is, is the water still heating? Yes. Is it causing, is, the, is it operating in the manner in which you're supposed to operate? Yes. Is it near the end of its life? Yes. Does that matter? No. Just because something's old, it doesn't mean that it's not useful. And that's, I'm talking about myself here as well. So a hot water heater and me, as long as it works still, then, then it's not something that the seller needs to replace. And they give you lists of things Pitted marsite. I had to actually look this up years ago to find out what the heck it was. It's the covering in the swimming pool. I don't know if they actually use marsite anymore. It's still in the contract. But if a swimming pool is pitted, 
it's a cosmetic imperfection. It's not something that the seller needs to replace. Tears, worn spots in discoloration of floor coverings, wallpaper or wall coverings. So if the carpet's ripped, the wallpaper's ripped, that's purely cosmetic, nothing that the seller needs to fix. Nail holes, scrapes, scratches, dents, chips or in corking or ceilings, walls, flooring, tiles, fixtures or mirrors, minor cracks in walls, floor tiles, windows, driveways, sidewalks, pool decks, garage and patio floors. So if you imagine a house that has, um, you know, cracks on the sidewalk, cracks in the garage, that always seems to create an argument as to whether or not that's within the general repairs. It, it's, you have to have a good inspector who will fight for the buyer to say how, how deep those uh, cracks are and how they are more damaging to the property than just purely cosmetic. And it's very hard to do. You would actually most probably have to get a ground surveyor out if you felt that there was land shifting. So many times the, the, the parties tend to just agree not to move forward if there's a massive crack that no one can decide whether or not it's actually a, a, a cosmetic or whether or not there's a more serious problem. Because having it inspected further to find out what the crack is uh, falls on the buyer. So it wouldn't fall on the seller because the buyer does the inspections that you can't ask the seller to do the inspection. It's the buyer's inspection. Um, it also doesn't include cracked roof tiles, curling or worn shingles or limited roof life. So the roof can be 100 years old. Um, as long as there's no evidence of actual leaks, leakage or structural damage, then it does not fall within the um, standard contract. So um, it's long as there's no leak. So old roof, again, that's one of the most asked items. The, 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 the uh, buyer's agent will come back to our listing and say, well, the roof's 23 years old. We want it replaced. And the seller is quite entitled to say, no, there's no leaks. It's just an end of life. And that's specifically included within the contract. Even if it's got a year left, it's still not something that the seller needs to to do unless they wanted to do it but the contract doesn't require them to do it so we call those general property repairs and they the seller all they have to do is to bring them into the in compliance with the description above so they have to bring them into a working condition so they operate in the manner in which they were designed to operate there's and then we go back to the process Within 10 days of the receipt of the buyer's written request to repair those items, the seller will either have the items repaired. So if there's a list, let's just give you an example. There's $1,000 on paragraph nine for general repairs. The buyer wants $1,000 worth done. They come back and the pool pump is not working. The, there is cracked a window that's fogged and cracked, or cracked in one and fogged in another, and there's some torn screens in the pool. The seller looks at it and thinks, oh my God, that's about two grand, but I really wanna sell this property. So they can just go out and have those things done. They don't have to go and get estimates. They don't have to go back to the buyer and say, what do you want fixed? They can just go out and have them fixed and everybody moves on. Prior to 2021, the old contract didn't have this little bit in there. It always meant that the seller had to go and get estimates and had to go back to the buyer. The 2021 version, the, the Farbar 6, changed it to allow the seller to just go out and get it fixed because it was ludicrous. You get the screen guy out and say, but how much is it going to cost to get these screens fixed? And he says, it's going to be 35 bucks a panel. And you say, okay, I'll get back to you because I have to go back to the buyer. You want to be able to just go ahead and get them fixed then and there. So that didn't make any sense whatsoever. So now the, the contract's more sensible and the seller can just go ahead and get them done. Now, if they decided just to go and get estimates and there was a $1,000 repair, then they have to come back to the buyer 
and say, I don't want to spend 2000 on this house. Your limit was 1000 You can either pick what $1,000 you want spent and where you want it spent. Do you want me to fix the pool pump or do you want me to fix the screens? What do you want me to do with that $1,000? And the, and the buyer can say, you know what? I'd just be quite happy if you fix the pool pump and everybody's happy. Or the buyer can say, well, if you're not going to make those repairs, uh, they're over my limit. I'm going to give you my cancellation, and I'm, we're going to I'm going to move forward and go look for another house. And that 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 that's an that's an example of what would happen if it came in over the repair limit. We've got three choices: seller fixes, and we move on with our life, fixes everything, or they give the buyer the choice of what they want fixed, and they pick, or they come back and they give the buyer a choice. He says, no, I want everything fixed. And the seller says, no, the buyer can then release and cancel, get their escrow back and move on with their lives. Go find another property. There is a process, which I'm not going to go into, um, but you'll see it in the handout, about what happens if they don't agree with the inspection. So if the seller comes up and says, hey, you know what? I don't agree with your inspector. That pool pump was replaced last year there's an opportunity for them to have a second and a third inspection. Second inspection is paid for by the seller. Third inspection is paid for by both of them. I rarely see that happen, but there's a process there if they can't agree on the repairs. Most of the time, um, we don't have any arguments. It's fairly apparent because of the type of repairs that need to be done. It's fairly apparent to everyone that they really do need to be done. The arguments normally come about on whether it's um, cosmetic or not, and whether or not a torn screen includes a missing screen. And the answer is no. If there was no screen ever there, then the screen doesn't have to be put in. But if there's one there and it's torn, then it has to be repaired. Any questions so far? Because we've now got to the end of the general repairs and I'm going to recap it quickly. So because it's it, when I say it quickly, it sounds simpler. So you have an inspection, licensed inspector. They find things wrong. They give a notice to the seller. These are the things that I want fixed. The seller says yes or no uh, within the repair limit. If they say yes, they can go ahead and repair them. Or if they, they can go out and get uh, in, invoices, estimates, and come back to the buyer and say, pick what you want. If it's over the repair limit and the seller won't fix it, the buyer can cancel. And there's a very specific set of items which fall within the paragraph 12, and it doesn't include cosmetic imperfections. That's a simplistic 38 second explanation of paragraph 12, which I know some realtors have cried themselves to sleep over at night. But it's fairly straightforward. Murray. Yes. Is it an How are you today? Good. Is it an option to just uh, request a credit for the amount rather than the repair? Good, cool. Yeah. I mean, the parties can always uh, vary what they want to do. And, and you know, back in... Um, early 2000 I had a town home that I owned and I thought you know what I don't know which way this pandemic's going to go I'm going to get rid of this town home and I put uh I put it on the MLS I had actually had an agent list it for me because I, I didn't have time to deal with it but the um agent listed it, I said I want standard contract only and the first contract that came in it said a thousand dollars in repairs and I said, uh, do you really want to do this? And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll do the inspection. They did the inspection. And at the end of it, the agent, my agent called me and I just said, give them $1,000. She said, well, you haven't told me what you want done yet. I said, offer them $1,000. She said, well, there isn't. A I said, just offer them $1,000. Let's be done with it. So we don't have to go through that process. And that's always an option. And I built that into my mind when I was pricing the property because I knew with this town home was not that old. I knew there wasn't going to be anything major wrong with it. And when I actually looked at the inspection report, there was a GFI, you know, 35 bucks or whatever. And the uh, fridge light wasn't working. Oh, 
you know, how much is that 35 cent bulb or whatever they are these days. But that's what you, you, you know, that's what sellers like about this is we're not going to dither around asking for loads of money. They know what their liability is right up the start. And if they build it into their pricing, it's always an option for them to say, look, you know, what I had, I, I looked at your repairs I would estimate there's about a thousand dollars of repairs here. Would you be happy if I credited you a thousand dollars? And most times the buyers will say yes, unless it's someone like my daughters who don't like doing uh, handiwork and they want someone else to fix it for them. There's an opportunity for them uh, to do it. And my son has no clue how to use a screwdriver, so he'd be the same way as well. I didn't raise them that well mechanically. mechanically. <laughs> All right. So is that a good, good question, Tom. Yeah, they can always do that. Any other questions on general repairs before we move on to creepy crawlies? Mm. Quite too nice. Okay. There's one little thing in, in this that's uh, hidden away in the contract. Let's just say they get to the end of the inspection period and the buyer has not served a written notice on the seller with their request for repairs. If there's no written notice comes back from the seller, so let's say we, we make our repair request. We make our repair request. The seller gets the repair request and then just sits on it, doesn't do anything, doesn't come back and give a notice. Either the if there's no notice from the seller to the buyer, the buyer can cancel and get their money back. And if there's no notice from the buyer to the seller, the seller can cancel and give their deposit back. It's hidden in there. I, I don't think I've ever heard of it ever being used, but it is in there. And I don't bother spending too much time on things that are never going to happen because all we're going to do is you're going to pick up the phone and call me anyway and we're going to work through it. But if everyone was silent, and there was no notices flying backwards and forwards, the contract actually explains what you do. Paragraph 12C, wood destroying organisms, uh, WDO, inspections and repairs. A Florida licensed pest control business can be used to determine the existence of pest, past or present WDO infestation and damage caused by that WDO infestation. They actually define what a wood destroying organism is. And I had to look up a few of these years ago. An arthropod, um, which is a basically wood ants, I believe, if I remember rightly, it's like carpenter ants, things that eat wood. Uh, plant life, termites, powder post beetles, which is a great name for a rock band. Old House Borers, another good punk name, wood decaying fungi that damages or infests seasoned wood in a structure. It excludes the fences that surround the property. What you won't see there is mold. So always a question about mold, and I'm gonna hit that right now so we can put that to rest. If you look at the as is contract on the riders section in paragraph 19, you will see that there's not a rider I, I as in India. It says reserved. If you look at rider I in the standard contract, it says mold addendum. The reason is that mold is not specifically covered in the standard contract. So if, they, if the buyer is worried about mold and you're using the standard contract, then add rider UI as in India. On the as is contract, we don't need it because they can cancel for any or no reason. So there's absolutely no point in putting it in there. And I do see now and again in um, DocuSign or in whatever it's called, command, I do see some people adding the mold rider to the Aziz contract. It's, it's like wearing a belt and suspenders. There's absolutely no point in it at all because you've got the right to cancel for any or no reason in the um, Aziz contract anyway. 
But with a standard contract, you haven't got the right to cancel for any or no reason. And mold is not a thing that is in the standard contract. So you would add rider irons in India in order to protect your buyer if you got in there and found out there was some black mold or some, and that hadn't actually damaged anything. It was just in there because you'll notice that this definition of WDO doesn't include spores or mold. It, it talks about decaying fungi and apparently mold is not fungi. Whew, glad I got that out. Um, and I put an article in Dropbox, which was written by uh, the Associate General Counsel for Florida Realtors, explaining that whole uh, rider eye um, fiasco and why, and, and just exactly what I told you, but more fancy words. Um, if any of the WDO defined in here is found, the buyer is to deliver a report, very similar to the general repair limit, to the seller during the inspection period, and then the seller shall have 10 days from receiving that WDO report to get estimate damage, a damage estimate from a licensed contractor, corrective treatment estimate from a WDO inspector, and then copy delivered to the buyer. If cost to treat and repair is below the limit, then the seller shall have the treatments done. If it's above, they go through the same processes as, as we talked about in general repairs. Yes, we've got WDO, we've got carpentrance running everywhere. It's gonna cost $2,000 to repair and treat. Your limit was a thousand, what do you want to do? And the buyer can say, give me a thousand, I'll have half the ants killed and then or um, I doubt if that'll work. Or, or they can just cancel the contract because the seller's not prepared to, to um, repair over the limit. And then, um, again, inspection period, notice, seller has 10 days to investigate, get estimates, and then the buyer then has five days within the um, receipt of the estimate from the seller to decide what they're going to do. So it's basically 15 days inspection, 10 days estimates, five days decision. So that could drag out quite a long while, but in, in practice, it normally happens pretty quickly. Um, if neither party delivers such notice to the seller, either party may terminate by serving written notice on the other and the buyer always gets their escrow back. Very similar. Just to, do you see how easy and how, how easy it is? that once you understand general repairs, WDO and permits tends to flow straight off of that. And then I'm gonna go through permits. On the as is contract, there's absolutely nothing the seller has to do with permits other than disclose the knowledge of any open, expired or unpermitted improvements. That's all the seller has to do. And if the buyer requests, the seller has to give them documents that helps the buyer close out the open expired or unpermitted work. That's the as is contract. With the standard contract, it puts the burden back on the seller. So during the inspection period, the buyer may examine records or documents to determine whether there are any open expired or unpermitted improvements to the property. And then during the inspection period, they deliver a written notice, sound familiar, to the seller, letting them know that there's open, expired, or unpermitted improvements. Seller shall promptly deliver all plans, written documents, and other info in the seller's possession. And then from 10 days from the written notice, get a cost to repair by an appropriate licensed person and deliver a copy to the buyer. And then no later than five days, the buyer comes back and says, These are the things that. I want repaired and these are the things I, I are prepared to accept or I want them all done and then they go through that whole shenanigan. Um, so no later than five days, it's the only slight difference, no later than five days prior to the closing date and up to the permit le limit, they must have open, expired and permits identified by buyer or known by seller closed by the government entity. And delays can happen, especially when you're dealing with uh, the local authorities in, to get these permits closed out. And then the seller has to provide written documents. Now, if closing out is delayed by the government, 
The closing date can be extended for up to 10 days to complete the permit final inspection. If it doesn't get closed out within 10 days, either party can cancel and the buyer gets the escrow back. So be swift. If, you've got, if, if permits are an issue for your buyer, then be quick in your inspection, be quick in your notice and encourage the seller to be quick in getting everything worked out. Sometimes the permits one is one, as, as Tom mentioned, that's most probably one that would be better settled with giving the buyer a credit rather than having to wait to get these things uh, closed out. However, it's very difficult to estimate how much a, con how much a permit is to is going to cost to close out, especially if it's something that's uh, unpermitted work. We don't know the, the, the range of what's got to be done. If they've built a, a room at the back of the house, we don't know if the, if the county are going to make you demolish it. We don't know if they're just going to come around and say, hey, yeah, it's fine, uh, $25 permit. It could be thousands. It could be not very much. So we need to find out quickly how much that's going to cost. So there are three things, general, WDO, permits, inspection, 10 days to get estimates, five days to respond from the buyer. Up to the, per, up to the repair limits, if it's over the repair limit, the buyer can, the, sorry, the seller can choose to repair. It, the buyer can re, uh, choose which ones they want and which ones they don't want, or the buyer can cancel if the seller's not prepared to pay the amounts over the repair limit. And then lastly, uh, we have a walkthrough and inspection on the exactly the same as the as is really. On the day prior to closing or the day of closing, the buyer or the rep can perform a walkthrough and a follow-up walkthrough to confirm that all personal property is removed. It's in its as is condition and the seller has made the required repairs, replacements, and met all their contractual obligations. And then 12F says, all the uh, treatment contracts and warranties for WDO and for the work will convey to the buyer at closing. That, my friends, is the standard contract in 51 minutes. Actually, 48 minutes, because I talked nonsense for the first three. In your handouts, you will see Talk of Rider L, which is a right to inspect and cancel. This, in effect, I, I haven't got time to talk about it today, but I wrote this article about it a couple of years ago, and it explains how you can turn the standard contract into a more of an as-is type contract. I'd be happy to talk about that on one of the broker for, uh, roundtables. Um, I have the article in there, which is the Mold Rider uh, conversation that Meredith Caruso wrote the article on. I prepared a standard contract cheat sheet. So if ever you get one, it has um, pretty much the highlights of the notes that we have today, but checklists. So you can actually hand it to the inspector and say, this is a standard contract. I want you to focus on these items. That's uh, what that's for and then of course the handout that i just walked through i am now all yours for questions i'm going to put the handout dropbox link back in there um and then just in case anyone missed it and oh um, right any questions comments abuse A big picture of Tom's t shirt. Any questions? There's got to be. Come on. I couldn't have explained it that well. Uh, question. Yes. <laughs> For example, if the seller agreed to do these repairs, uh, what is the deadline? Is is it's gonna be just before the closing day or during or during the I think it's impossible during the inspection period. No. Good question. So all the repairs have to be completed on the by the day before closing. Okay. Because the buyer's gonna do their walkthrough on that day to make sure it's been done. So if you're the listing agent and you your your seller has had a heck of a job finding a plumber. Um, to fix the uh, leaky washing machine thing, 
then you're going to keep the buyer updated as to the progress of the repairs. And if necessary, you may have to renegotiate and say, look, we can't get this done now. We may give you a credit or ultimately we'd have to extend the closing until we get this thing fixed. Mm -hmm. But we, we've, we've just got to keep keep the parties informed. OK, it means during the during the during the inspection uh, period, we we are agreed to do whatever we have to do, the seller. And the rest of the day, just before closing, the seller uh, should do all the repairs. Otherwise, sure. you have to extend the, the contract or give the credit back, right? Exactly. Correct. You've got it. Okay. Thank you. You've got it. All right. Then we've got here. Any questions in here? Not as complicated as I thought. Dun, dun, dun. That's what... I said it does sound scary, doesn't it? This contract, but it's not. It, it's uh, it's a, it's a bit, it's because it's so wordy. Um, you know, one of the things I learned sort of studying over the years was if you take something that's really really wordy and make it boil it down to its simplistic form. I was terrible in high school. I flunked high school awful. I was a horrible horrible person. But what I found when I had to go back and retake some of my tests was English Lit. Those um, study guides, you know, there was this horrible Shakespeare, Hamlet, who cares to be or not to be? But if you actually break it down into a simple story, it's kind of a cool story. It's just that it's been confused by all the words. And I think the same, th you know, the, the standard contract is very much like Hamlet. It's a load of words, but when it boils down to it, it's a very practical, good uh, document. And as I say, there are listing agents out there. They actually use it as a filter, um, especially when it was a seller's market, high seller's market. They use it as a filter because if they put in the MLS, only a standard contract will be accepted. You're kind of saying to the the buyer's agent you better know what you're doing because you know we're, we're going to go into this contract and i am going to be controlling the transaction unless you know that standard contract and i do know that there are a lot of brokerages out there that don't even teach this stuff it's it's definitely not taught as widely because they it's easier to teach the as is but if i was a real estate agent and someone was getting in my car or if, if you still do that if you're out showing houses, if I'm going to waste my Saturday afternoon showing houses to someone, when they make an offer, I would be really hoping to use the standard contract because I don't want them cancelling on me because the kitchen smells of sausages. You know, they, well, some of the odd things that these people come up with. Questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, now, I apologize. I did miss your conversation about this because I had to take a call, but I have a few questions. Um, when it comes to the permits, I'm even confused with the as is as to what my responsibility is as an agent, what the client's responsibility is as far as the permits go for the seller and the buyer, and what happens if we close and a permit issue comes up from before. Good. So the biggest mistake that agents make with an as is, is they don't do a permit search during the inspection period. So taking the as is, if I, the best advice I can give you is you look at the buyer and say, the seller has put in the seller's disclosure that there's no open or expired permits. We saw that there was a, the garage had been turned into a ping pong room and basketball court and sauna. So we know that there's been some work done on this house. Therefore, I suggest, Mr. Buyer, that you go to the county or the city and check the permit office. Because no one is going to be checking for permits. It, some title companies do it, some don't. Some title companies do it if you ask them and you pay the money. But once you go outside of the inspection period, if the seller didn't know about unpermitted work or didn't know they were expired or didn't know there were any open, then the there's no obligation for the seller to do anything at all other than give plans. Whereas with the standard contract, you are going to 
proactively do those searches and the seller has an obligation to fix within the repair limit. On the as is, they don't have any obligation to fix. So both on both contracts, it is the buyer's responsibility to do the search. Yes. Okay, thank you. And I say the buyer, it's not yours. Um, I use the example of, uh, there's a county south of Lake County called Polk County. You may have seen and read about Polk County. It's, mm -hmm. it's situated just, uh, just behind 1952 and in between 1860, not road names, but years. There, <laughs> Their permit office, when years ago, they were still on a card index system. And you could talk to Cletus on Wednesday and they'd say there's no open permits. And you can call Rosemary on Thursday and she'd have a wad of them. So, you know, if you did it as the listing, as the buyer's agent and went back to your buyer and said, no, nope, there's no open or expired permits. And then after they closed, it was just because of the chaos that's in the, the county system it would be you that would be liable. So I always urge you to get the buyer to do those searches if it's important to them. You know, I, I, I don't think I've, even in my own purchases, I've not really been worried about it. It's not something that yeah. nags at me. I'd be worried if there was, you know, it look, when the inspector comes in and looks at the electrical and says, it looks like a 12 year old has done this electrical, I'm gonna be looking for permits for the electrical work. But, if it's just, you know, the house looks good, everything looks safe, you know, most probably you're not worried whether or not the hot water heater was replaced with the permit, as long as the inspector says, yeah, it's wired correctly. Um, so to some people they're worried about and some people they're not. Roof permits may be a problem for insurance. So, you know, the, the sellers shoot themselves in their foot because if you don't get the roof properly permitted and, the, and it says in the county that the roof was replaced in 20, 2006, but the seller got it replaced in 2020, but didn't get a permit, the insurance company is going to go with the 2006 until it's proven otherwise. Yeah, some of that shows up in IMAP, but not all of it. So I wasn't sure um, who was supposed to do that and who was responsible if That's they the found point. it after closing. Yeah, after closing, it's a defect after closing. It's between the buyer and seller, and we're not involved in it. Okay. Now, we'd provide evidence. Um, so when you when you do a um, a listing appointment, just say to the seller, you know, are there any open or expired permits? Because it will come back and bite them. And and if they say yes, there are, okay, do you want to fix them? No, not particularly. Then disclose them, and 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 that's it. That's all they can do. And then the buyer, if it's an as-is contract, they're just going to have to accept it with those open or expired permits. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Anything else? I need questions. I don't, I only survive on questions. I don't get enough all day. <laughs> right, so where's Julia as in Kelly, whoever you are? Where are you? Unmute yourself, dear. Was this everything you expected, hoped, and dreamed about? Oh, everything and more. Actually, <laughs> I it was I like that it was less. It was more concise and more clear than I expected. Definitely a lot easier to wrap my head around. So good. Very good. appreciative. And I, I thank you. And, and it's because of Kelly we're here this afternoon, even though she calls herself Julia on the screen. It's because of her we're here this afternoon because she asked me a question about when are you gonna teach class on the standard contract? And we haven't done it for ages and I thought it'd be a good opportunity to um, just to do what we, you know, a pop-up class for those that were interested. And I did record it. So I can um, also post it on the forum uh, with, um, with the, uh, 